who is there better in a way of life than someone who has submitted their whole life to Allah and they are among the righteous in actions and they follow the same way of life of Ibrahim alayhi salam monotheist never worship more gods and Allah chose Ibrahim as his best friend We are going into the life of the great messenger Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, Abraham. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. He is a remarkable man who was nicknamed as a Qanit. Qanit means somebody who was very devout worshipper of Allah. He was also described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being Hanif. Hanif is somebody who turns away from disbelief and inclines towards Islam. He was also a man who was named and called an Ummah, a nation. And we know that the term Ummah usually is in reference to many people, an entire community. Yet Allah Ta'ala refers to one individual, he was an Ummah. In other words, you can say that all of the remarkable characteristics that you find within one nation, bravery and generosity, knowledge, the rest of it, all of these characteristics of greatness that you find scattered around in one nation, Allah Ta'ala is telling us He was a one-man nation. He had gathered the strings of greatness from all of the corners of this term, Allahu Akbar. We know that He was Khalilullah, the close friend of Allah. And Khullah is in reference to a friendship, a relationship that is at the peak of love. And that is why our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to the Muslims before he died, I make it very clear to all of you that nobody here is my Khalil. Not even Abu Bakr. Only Allah is my Khalil. You are my companions. Of course, whom he loves and cherishes. But the status of Khullah, i.e. the love as they define it, the love that had penetrated the deepest part of your heart, this only belongs to Allah. This man whom we're going to be speaking about today was so close to his creator that Allah referred to him as my Khalil. How great was this individual, Allahu Akbar. He was so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so dear to him that Allah would manipulate the laws of physics for the sake of his comfort and welfare. And he was a man who was so dear to the Messenger of Allah, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he would name one of his children after him. A man came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said to him, You are the best of creation, O Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did the Prophet respond? He said, that's not me, that's Ibrahim. But from his humility, from his humbleness, he said, that is Ibrahim. And he is in fact one of the five who are identified as Ulil Azm, meaning those endured with great perseverance. He is the father of the prophets. And our scholars say, most of the generations of prophets that came after him, or all of them even, came from his lineage. He is such a great man, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him. Not once, not twice, but again and again. And he passed every single test. And you have a very special connection to Ibrahim as well. You mention him every day, right? In the tashahud. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim. So every single day, not once, not twice, not three times, but you talk about Ibrahim often. And that is a reminder of how fundamental Ibrahim was in your Islam. That he was an example for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So Allah tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, follow the Milla of Ibrahim, meaning the religion. And then he also told his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say, Allah guided me to a straight path, the Milla of Ibrahim. Who would want to turn away and not desire the Milla of Ibrahim except one who demeans himself? Meaning if you have any respect for yourself, you'll follow the Milla of Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. Here we find a young boy 
He was born in Iraq. He was born in Babylon. His father, the Quran says his name was Azar. So we will use that particular name. Azar, the father of Abraham. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of how Azar used to make idols and sell them. So the young boy, he was watching his father carving idols out of wood and stone. And then he would see his father selling them. Then he would notice people prostrate to these things that his own father was carving. And he would notice people asking these stones and these pieces of wood to give them good health and to grant them long lives and to give them sustenance and to guide them and so on. So he was shocked. One day he seen this big idol and he tells his father, Oh my father, what is this? He says, these are idols. So it has such a big ear. He says, yes, this is because it hears everything. This idol here, those who will buy it, it will listen to them. They used to say that there is the spirit form within them, who they represent. They represent spiritual beings. They represent pious men of the past. So we're not really worshipping the statues, they used to say. We are worshipping the form within them that will bring us closer to Allah. They'd come and worship an idol and that same morning or that same day, they'd go and do their business day and they get a profitable day. Another man would get a bad day. But then he'd come to this person and says, what's this idol did nothing to me. The other person would say to him, but look, I pray to this God today and look what I got. Maybe you pray to the wrong God. And despite Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam being a young man at this particular episode in his life, but he was a man of wisdom because Allah says we had given Ibrahim wisdom from before. Even from a young man, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was gifted with knowledge and understanding. Why was Ibrahim given knowledge? Because he asked Allah for knowledge when he said, Oh Allah, please give me wisdom. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this young boy. Allah says, Remember when Ibrahim asked his father and his nation, What is this that you are worshipping? They said, We are worshipping idols and we will continue worshipping these idols. So he asks them a question. Do they hear you when you're calling out to them? Can they benefit you in any way or can they harm you in any way? They said, we found our forefathers worshipping them. He says, you see these things that you people are worshipping, you and your forefathers, all of these things that you've been worshipping for so many years, they are all, including yourselves, enemies of mine. There is only one that I worship and that is Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of all the worlds. So from a very young age, he understood. I need to only worship whoever made me. Now this was the sense Allah says, Allah gave him the guidance at a very young age. When he started questioning, some narrations say his age was only seven. Ibrahim alayhi salam was born to non-believing parents. All these years, his mother and father think that they are doing well. They're worshipping idols, they're going to paradise. God loves them, they love God. That's their belief. They had no idea. And then suddenly, their own little son comes up to them. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, when he said to his father, O oh my father, why do you worship which that can neither see or hear, nor can it do anything for you? His father could not provide him with a proper answer. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he starts making mention of qualities that need to be found in a deity that anyone should worship. And he says, the one who created me and the one who guides me. Whoever created me, I owe my worship to him. Whoever guides me is the same one who created me. I owe my worship to him. The one who feeds me and who quenches my thirst. The one whom when I am sick and ill, he grants me cure. That is the one, the only, the creator. The one who will cause my death and he will give me life thereafter. And the one whom I have hope in that he can forgive my sins on the day of reckoning. Oh my Rabb, grant me the judgment between right and wrong and join me with those who are pious. 
his father used to say to him things like, son, these questions should not be asked. You can't ask these questions, it's blasphemy. And he kept asking one time, in one narration it says that his father slapped him. Saying, don't you dare question like this anymore. So his father could not answer him. And now he's beginning to get angry. Yet Ibrahim السلام, maintained his respectful approach to his father. So after a long argumentation about, okay, now we've understood that father, you don't have an answer for this and I can't follow it. I would like to introduce to you something. Oh father, out of respect, I have received a knowledge from Allah. Follow me. I will guide you to a straight path. His father began to sort of come round to his argument. And he said, son, all right, I can't answer you any of the questions you've given me. At least let's benefit something from these idols. Can you take them and sell them for me? So his son went out and he took the idols and began to call out in the market. It says that he began to call out the following words because you see he's a truthful man, he can't lie. He says, who would like to buy something that cannot benefit and cannot harm? Obviously no one's going to buy anything. So he came at the end of the day and he had sold no idols, nothing. His father said, son, what'd you do? He said, I went out and I advertised, said, who wants to buy something cannot benefit or harm? He said, son, how can you sell something like that? If you say it cannot benefit or harm. He said, well, father, this is what you're worshipping. And truly, it's never benefited anything or harmed in any way. His father started to become angry at his son. He said, this is the religion of our forefathers. You will stick to it. I'm your dad. You can't tell me what to do. And so arrogance began to develop in the father of Ibrahim. Now Ibrahim السلام, understands that his father understands everything, what he said. There's no argument anymore. He's just being stubborn, his father. And he needs to save him. So now he approaches him in a different way. Oh, father, do not worship the shaitan. Verily, the shaitan surely is rebellious to Allah the most gracious. The one you are worshipping represents the shaitan and the shaitan disobeyed the Rahman, the kind one. Don't do that father. As you are kind to me, don't disobey the one who is kind to both of us, Allah. Because the shaitan was like that. His father wouldn't listen. Now he's growing in rage more, turning away. Finally, Ibrahim السلام, said to him, Oh my father, I fear that a punishment may afflict you from Allah the most merciful and so you become a companion of the shaitan. Here now he's getting desperate, Ibrahim السلام. His father is falling in the fire. He doesn't want to see his father in the fire. The shaitan did the same thing. He was arrogant father. Now his father has had enough. He the father replied, Are you turning from my gods? Oh Ibrahim, surely if you do not stop what you are doing, I shall stone you. And now leave me alone for a good long time. Now this is after years of arguing in a proper way, calling his father. Finally, his father said to him, I will stone you if you stay any longer. In other words, you're no longer my son. I disown you. Once he saw that his father had no more hope in his son and his son had no more hope in guiding his father. Ibrahim السلام, still insisted and resorted to the last words. Ibrahim السلام, said, peace be upon you. I will pray to my Lord to forgive you. Indeed, he is to me the most merciful and gracious. And I am leaving you and those whom you invoke besides Allah. I will invoke my Lord that I may be blessed in my dua. After Ibrahim السلام, left, it is said that he kept on making dua for his father until his father died. And even after his father's death, he kept making dua for him until finally Allah SWT commanded Ibrahim السلام, that he is not allowed to do that anymore. Allah says in the Quran, and Abraham's act of seeking forgiveness for his father was nothing but only because of a promise he had made to him. But when it became clear to him that he was an enemy to Allah, meaning his father, he disassociated himself from him. Surely Ibrahim was most tender-hearted, forbearing. It is important to note 
that the father of Ibrahim, Azar, will be in a great state of regret for having rejected the da'wah of Ibrahim. He tells us alayhi salatu wasalam that Ibrahim will meet his father on the day of judgment. And on the face of Azar will be darkness and will be dust and soil. Ibrahim will say to his father, Did I not say to you, O oh my father, don't disobey me? His father will now say to his son in humility, O oh my son, today I will not disobey you. Ibrahim will now turn to Allah in dua and he will say, O oh Allah, you promised me that you will not humiliate me on the day of resurrection. So what greater humiliation can there be for me than to see my father in the state going to hell? And then Allah will say to Ibrahim, O oh Ibrahim, I have made paradise impermissible for the disbelievers. Then Allah will say to Ibrahim, look beneath you, what is that under your feet? He will look beneath him and he will see his father in the form of a hyena. His father has been transformed into a form of an ugly, horrid hyena in its filth, in its vomit, in its blood. Then the hyena will be taken from its feet and thrown into the hellfire. And that will be the end of Azar, the father of Ibrahim. What an evil destination the fire is. It's from the wisdom of Allah that Allah would transform the figure of his father into a hyena and to make it easier upon his heart when he sees his father being thrown into the hellfire. And this is the fate of every individual who dies having not accepted the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having not submitted to the way of Islam. So Ibrahim alayhi salam gave up on his father and moved along. After some time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam continued with them to remind them that whoever created the skies and the earth and whoever made us, that is whom you are supposed to be worshipping. These stones and these idols have not made anyone. He says, your Rabb is the Rabb, the creator of the skies and the earth. Whoever made everything in existence is your Rabb. After saying that, he noticed something that these people, when they wanted sustenance, they quickly ran to these stones and they quickly ran to all these pieces of wood that they had all around. And they went and they asked for sustenance. And he noticed that they even went to people who were dead and they started asking them for sustenance. So look at what he says. All those whom you are calling out to besides Allah to give you sustenance, they do not own a droplet of sustenance. Allah is the owner of sustenance. So you should solely and only ask Allah directly for sustenance. For indeed, he is the one who will grant you sustenance and you should be grateful and thankful to him alone because it is to him alone you are going to return to. What a powerful statement from a young boy growing up. The only answer they had, one thing, we have found our forefathers doing this. That's it. No other answer. They were happy and this is the way. And because people were making money, one borrows the God, the other one doesn't borrow the God. And what else used to happen? When somebody asked an idol something and say that was done, people started borrowing that idol to say this one's got more power. Look at how foolish they were. So Ibrahim alayhi salam says to himself, Wallahi, I will plot against the idols. Once these people are gone, I am going to destroy these idols. A few people heard him making mention of the fact that he wants to plan something. They used to have this festival that they all come out of the city and go out to the desert and worship the idols there. Maybe introduce new idols, maybe come up with new beliefs. And it was a must on everyone to come out and participate in that festival. When they told him, let's go, we want to go and pray. He says, I am sick. Now he was not physically ill, but what he meant is, I'm sick of what you people are doing. I'm not coming with you. So they went away. Ibrahim salam looked around and he saw all the statues which they revered and worshipped. And there was a big one at the front, the biggest of them all. So he grabbed an axe and he grabbed some food. And sarcastically, Ibrahim a.s. a teenager, he came up to the statues and he began to put the food in front of them. And he said to them, 
eight. The statues didn't eat. So then Ibrahim salam said, what's wrong with you? Can't you speak? And then Ibrahim salam grabbed the axe and he began to destroy every idol one by one. He looked at the largest one and he had an idea. He hung the axe on the neck of the largest one. And he left. So when they came from a happy festival, everyone's smiling, happy. And then they come into their city and they were shocked to see the idols being destroyed and demolished. So they start to ask around, who committed such an evil crime? But the reality is, that's the best thing that someone could do. It's not an evil crime. So they were asking, who dares to do something like that? So one of them said, there is no one else except that young man that we used to always hear him speak bad about our idols. It's Ibrahim. And you know what? We didn't even see him in the festival. So there's no one else except him. So they said, yeah, let's bring him for questioning. So they brought Ibrahim alayhi salam in front of Ifran. And they told him, oh Ibrahim, are you the one that did this to our lords? He looks at them and said, I think it's the big statue that did to it. Look, he's got the axe around his neck. Ask him. He'll tell you. Now the people, dumbfounded, they looked at the big statue and surely the big statue was still all right and he had the axe around his neck. Allah says in the Quran, they came back to their senses briefly. They said, you always knew that they can't talk to us. Okay, they can't talk to us, we know this. So then Ibrahim salam said to them, then why are you worshipping these things that they can't even talk? Woe to you and whatever you worship, what's wrong with you? And then they wanted to put the punishment on Ibrahim salam. And they said, this young man had committed a severe crime and he must pay a severe punishment for it. So they got together and decided for anyone to harm our lords, their punishment must be a severe punishment. And the punishment of Ibrahim is to let out a severe fire that no one had experienced on earth and to cast Ibrahim in that fire. Let him feel the pain of the fire in return of what he done to our idols. They started gathering wood until it was the height of three-story buildings. That much for one man. Everyone contributed into this fire. Everyone bring timber as a retaliation for the Lord. That even the pregnant woman in her last day shall carry some timber to throw it in the fire. Everyone wants to participate. This person just killed and destroyed our idols. It says that it was so hot and so big, this fire, that people had to stay a distance of what is almost equivalent to half a kilometer away. It was that hot. Until the fire became so severe that some narration says that birds could not even fly from above it. And they tied Ibrahim alayhi salam with ropes in his legs and his wrists. They placed him in the catapult. And everyone is waiting, looking, to see the retaliation to take place against that person that killed the most beloved thing in their hearts, which is their Lord. And Ibrahim alayhi salam being tied with rope around his hands and legs and then casted into that fire. When Ibrahim alayhi salam was flying into the fire, Jibreel will come to Ibrahim and say, Oh Ibrahim, do you need any help? So Ibrahim says to him, from you, no, but from Allah, yes. This is the heart of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So attached with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in a moment that you even ask help from anyone and anything. He says, from you, no, but from Allah, yes. He made a dua. What was this dua? Hasbuna Allah wa ni'mal wakeel. Allah is enough for me. And he is the best disposer of affairs. There were stairs created. So he was 
literally coming down in such a beautiful way into the fire. And as he went in, Allah says, we said, oh fire, become cold and be a means of peace to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Only the ropes that he was tied with were burnt off. And the Prophet Sallallahu tells us that Ibrahim Alayhi Salam said, I have never had a more blissful and most relaxing moment than the day I was thrown in the fire. Some narrations tell us that Allah made a fountain of water and fruits such as grapes to be available for him in the fire to eat and drink. There are different narrations on how long he stayed in the fire. Some say a few days and then Ibrahim السلام, walked out of the fire in front of the people who were watching. They're just shocked looking at him. They don't know. So one young man gets up and he decides, I want to follow you. You are right. These people are wrong. Who was this young man? His nephew, Lut alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet Lut, he was not yet a prophet. He was a young boy. He came up and he's seen everything and he decided, I surrender to whoever made me as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lut accepted his message and believed in what he brought. Now there was a king by the name of Namrud and he heard about this young man, Ibrahim. And he called Ibrahim to his presence and he wanted to challenge him with his belief. He said to Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is your God? He said, my Lord is the one who brings life and causes death. The king, he said, I can also give life and give death. He brought in two of his captives and he brought his executioner. He said to him, kill this slave and free this slave. So he killed one and left one alive. He said, see, I killed and I kept alive. Now, obviously, this is not what Ibrahim salam meant. Now, Ibrahim salam didn't bother arguing more into that. So he went to a stronger argument immediately. What did he say? My Lord brings out the sun from where it rises. So you bring the sun out from where it sits. Why don't you do the opposite? The one who disbelieved, he was silenced. So he told him, get out of here. So Ibrahim alayhi salam left. Ibrahim alayhi salam has just witnessed the argument between him and the king Namrud. This caused Ibrahim alayhi salam to think. He didn't have doubt in that Allah can raise the dead. But it made a question inside of his brain about, I wonder how the reality is that Allah can give life out of death. I want to increase my certainty by seeing it with my eyes. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I want to see how do you give life to the dead? And Allah says, Oh Ibrahim, don't you believe? He says, Oh indeed I believe, but I just want to put a bit of comfort in my heart. I want to see it for myself. Allah told him, take four birds. So he got four birds. Then Allah says, cut them into pieces, mix them up totally and put all the different pieces onto different mountains. Then when you're standing, call them and see what happens. They will come flying back to you. Allahu Akbar. So he did that and then he called the birds and he started watching these birds. Amazing. When he started watching these birds, they flew back to him when he called. And then Allah says, and you should know that Allah is all powerful, all wise. Here, Ibrahim alayhi salam's closeness to Allah went even to a higher level. And he decides, look, I need to disappear from this area because they warned him. They said, we are going to kill you. So Ibrahim alayhi salam left with Lut alayhi salam out of the land of Babylonia, which he was in or close to Babylonia. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to send him to the holy lands, the land of Sham. Sham today is made up of a few countries, Palestine, Syria, 
Lebanon and Jordan, those areas put together, that entire region is called Asham. So as Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was going there, he stopped at a certain place called Harran. Some narrations tell us that Ibrahim alayhi salam met his wife, Sarah, and he sat there for a bit to see whether him and his family are able to establish their prayers and invite others to the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But over there he found a very different type of people. They also worshipped other than Allah, but these people worshipped stars. Each one chose a cluster of stars or a star of their own and made it their God and gave it a name and believed in it in their own superstitious beliefs. All of them believed that they can tell them the future and they can prevent them from things. So when they needed something, they look at their star and they call upon it. And each one had a name. So Ibrahim salam was a very smart and intelligent young man. He wanted to teach the people in a way without debating, getting to debates with them, to let them see for themselves that what they are worshipping is false. So what did he do? He did what they did, but not in seriousness. He said, you know, I choose for myself this star. This is my Lord, everyone. Obviously just to teach them, didn't mean it. When it faded away, he said, hold on. No, 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 no. I don't like those who leave me. If this is my Lord and I can see it, I should always be able to see it. Why has it left me? It's left me. No, 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 no. I want a Lord that is always with me. So then he waited. When he saw the moon bright, this is my Lord. Everyone, I've changed my mind. The star left me. Now this moon is huge. This is bigger, brighter. This has to be my Lord. This is my Lord. This is bigger. But then when the moon left, he said, if my Lord doesn't guide me, I will be among the losers. He's telling this to the people. And suddenly at sunrise, the sun appeared. These people used to worship stars, not the sun. But look, Ibrahim alayhi salam is showing them there's something bigger than the stars, the moon. The moon also goes, there's something bigger than the moon, the sun. He looked at the sun and he says, okay, this thing has now risen. It is the biggest from all of those. I think this must be the Rabb. It is more deserving of being a Rabb than those two things that just went by. Now when it set, what was left? There's nothing left now. The stars, gone. The moon, gone. The sun, gone. When the sun sets, what if you have a problem at night? Now who do you call out to? So what did he say? He said, oh my people, I am free. I disassociate myself completely from that which you are associating as partners with the one who made the skies, the earth, the stars, the moon, the sun, myself and yourselves. Whoever made me, you and all these creatures in existence, whoever he is, I owe my entire worship solely and only to him and I will never ever associate a speck of partnership with that maker of mine. These people started debating with him and there was a give and take speech. They are saying things, he is responding. They are saying things, he is responding. Then he said, how can you debate with me about my own maker, about Allah and he has guided me. I know that what I am doing is definitely correct. I do not have a speck of doubt. I do not fear anything that you are associating as partners with Allah. They can do nothing to me unless my own creator wills that something bad happen to me or anything happens to me. They cannot harm me. They cannot benefit me. I don't fear them at all. The only thing I fear, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my maker, wants something, it can happen. If he doesn't want it, it won't happen. How can I fear those things that you are associating as partners with Allah when you are not fearing the fact that you have associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not fearing Allah and the fact that you've associated partners with him and you want me to fear those partners that you have taken as partners with the maker. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. How? So he says, look out of us, the two parties, who is more deserving of peace and comfort and contentment and protection? Those who have believed and they have not contaminated their Iman with any association of partnership with Allah. They are more deserving of comfort, contentment, protection 
and they are the ones who are rightly guided. And then Allah says, that was the power of debate that we gave to Ibrahim over his people. Look, this is the Nabi who debated the most. May Allah's peace be upon him. He debated with his parents. He debated with his community. He debated with the king. He debated with this one. He debated with the people in Harran. And each time he defeated them completely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him that evidence against his people. The ability not only to engage them in discussion, but to overpower them in such a way that they have no answer. So when a person has no answer, what do they do? They need to start threatening you physically. It shows they have been defeated completely. So after that, they started threatening him to kill him. How many people believed in him? No one. Only Sarah. And Ibrahim السلام, married her. And they left. Him and Sarah and Lut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had had a plan for the Prophet Lut السلام. Lut السلام, on the way was ordered that he has a mission to deliver as a prophet in the land of the people of Sodom. Lut departed and went on his mission to the people of Sodom. In the meantime, Ibrahim left with his wife Sarah to Egypt and it had a tyrant king. Sarah the wife of Ibrahim was extraordinarily beautiful. In fact, our scholars say that she was the most beautiful woman on earth in her time. And some say, in fact, she was the second most beautiful woman after Hawa, after Eve, the wife of Adam السلام. The king of Egypt liked to have beautiful women. When Ibrahim السلام, entered the land of Egypt, a group of soldiers of the king, they went back to their king and they said, we have just seen two strangers enter our land. There is a man and a woman. And she is one of the most beautiful women we have ever seen. The king said to them, go and ask what the relationship of this man is to her. And if he says that he is her husband, then kill him and bring the woman to me. I want her for myself. So they went. But along the way, Jibreel alayhi salam had come down to Ibrahim first and said to him the situation. So Ibrahim alayhi salam turned to Sarah and he said to her the following words. You see this land that we are in? He said, by Allah, there isn't a single believer on the face of the earth except for me and you. And obviously, Lut alayhi salam. So when these people come to you and if they ask you, who am I to you? Tell them that I am your brother. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ibrahim السلام, he had to use a certain type of statement three times in his life, which although it is not a clear cut lie, but the way it sounded, it sounded like a lie thrice. The first time was when he wanted to destroy the idols and he said, I'm sick. What he meant is not I'm physically sick, although that's what they understood. He meant I'm sick and tired of what you people are doing and I don't want to come. Secondly, when he destroyed those idols, they told him who destroyed these idols. He looked at them and he says, I think it's the big one here that did it. Why don't you ask him and he might tell you if he can talk. Now this was obviously something that was common sense. We can't call it a lie, but for them it was a lie. So that was the second one. The third one was now when the king sent a message and they're asking, who's this woman with you? He said, it's my sister. And they had separated the two. Why did he say my sister? If he said it's my wife, they would have killed him and taken her away. So what happened is they called her in. Who are you? This is what my name is. This is where I come from. And who is that man? Well, he's my brother. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam had told her already that look, I'm not lying. You know, you are my sister in Islam. We are the only two believers here. So when they asked her, she happily said, he is my brother. The king decided, right? He called the women folk to adorn her. And he says, I'm marrying her and we're taking her. And now place her in the bedroom and get her ready. They all got together and they started preparing her in the room and so on. She made a dua. 
She says, Oh Allah, I have worshipped you and you alone. And Ya Allah, I have kept myself pure and clean for my husband. Completely pure. Ya Allah, you protect me and safeguard me. And that king will see a beautiful woman in front of him that he hasn't seen before. So he'll run to her. So she said, Ya Allah, I ask you for your protection. Allah Azza wa Jal made that king paralyzed. He couldn't move anymore. So he said, please, please, release me. I will not do anything to you. He realized it's all coming from her. And then she said, Ya Allah, release him, Ya Allah, or else he'll order his soldiers to kill me in return of what happened to him. And when he was released, he came again. She asked Ya Allah, protect me again from him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again will paralyze him and not let him move. And again, this king will say, please, release me, I would not do anything to you, I would not harm you. So she said, Ya Allah, release him with us, he'll order his soldiers to kill me and return what happened to him. And the third time again, after he was released, the second time will attempt to get in his heart and say, say, Ya Allah, protect me from him. And then he said the third time, release me and I promise you I would not get near you. And she said, Ya Allah, release him and let him go. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala released this king. And he screamed at his soldiers said, I don't know why you people got me, a human being or a devil. He freed her and he gave her wealth. And he also gave her one of his servants. She was a lady, a pious, good lady with great character, but she was captured from war and became his servant. Her name was Hajar. And he gave her to her as her own servant. Hajar was released. And the reason why he wanted to release her was not because he really wanted to give her to her, but Hajar was giving him extreme problems. She didn't like the king. He wasn't getting anything out of her. So he gave her to Sarah and said, I don't have any use with this woman either. And Sarah went back to Ibrahim salam. She'll enter the place of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam is praying to Allah so Ibrahim will say to Sarah what happened so she said Allah had protected me from the oppressive person and so he decided let me now go away let me go back to Asham I left there because of the drought I'm going to go and he went back to Jerusalem and that is where he settled once again with his wife Sarah and he had this girl known as Hajar Time passed and Ibrahim salam grew older and he gave da'wah to the people. Hardly anyone believed. And Sarah salam grew old. Ibrahim salam was about 80 years old at that time. And Sarah a little bit younger. And obviously they discovered that Sarah salam could not give birth. And Ibrahim salam was longing for a son to carry on his message after him. And he called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a son. Sarah alayhi salam, she felt sorry for him and said, I have freed my servant Hajar and I offer her to you to marry her. She did it for the purpose that she felt sorry for her husband and she knew he wanted an heir. So she gave him Hajar alayhi salam from her kindness and her piety. And he married her, Hajar alayhi salam as a second wife. Ibrahim salam said, O oh my Lord, grant me among the righteous. Allah says, we gave him a young son who was very intelligent and patient. Ismail salam from Hajar. Ismail salam was made a prophet and a messenger. This is a great reward, great blessing for Ibrahim salam. Something happened. After waiting for 80 or 90 years of his life for this son, Allah orders Ibrahim salam to do something amazing, unimaginable. He orders him that he must take his wife Hajar and his only son Ismail, who he's been waiting for for over 80 years, into the middle of the desert, middle of nowhere, far away, leave them there by themselves, and return back to Palestine. Just think about it. 86 years waiting for this child and the child comes. 
and his heart is so attached to the child now, put him and his mother in a place, not a town, not a city with civilization, this you know, services, these people around, in the middle of nowhere. Ibrahim Azam did not ask why. The order of Allah came and that's enough. He took them when Hajar did not know what the plan was. When they reached the middle of the desert, which is where Mecca is today, they settled down with a bit of water and a bit of food. Suddenly, Ibrahim salam stood up, turned his back and began to walk the other way. A Hajar walked up to him and said, Ya Ibrahim, he didn't reply. Ibrahim, he didn't reply, kept walking. She realized that he's leaving in there. A woman and her baby in the middle of the desert, and they have a little bit of food, a little bit of water. How are they going to survive? She said, are you leaving us? He kept walking. Ya Ibrahim, who are you leaving us to? In the middle of nowhere. Ibrahim salam did not answer. He kept looking to the ground, not even looking at her and walking straight ahead. Finally, Hajar salam came to her senses. She stopped and said, Is it Allah who commanded you to do this? He said, Yes. And he kept walking. All she said was this, Allah will not abandon us. He's going to look after us. She was comforted. This is the quality of Ibrahim alayhi salam. No matter what Allah said, even if it did not make sense to him, he surrendered to it because he knew where it came from. So as he went, he says, Oh Allah, I have left there behind some of my family in that valley close to the sacred home. I have left them there in order to go and fulfill an act of worship for your sake, the Salah. He says, therefore, O Allah, let the hearts of the people incline towards that valley and grant them produce in abundance so that they may be thankful. Days passed. They ate and drank whatever they had and then they ran out of it. He was breastfed for a while and then the food ran out and the mother is looking at the child and she says, no, I must make an effort to try and look for some food. So she decided to go up the hillock, the Mount Safa. She went up the mountain and she's looking. Is there any sign? No sign. No life. No movement. No nothing. So she came down, making dua to Allah. And when she gets to the bottom, she's running. Why is she running at the bottom? Because she wants to get to the top of the other mount on the other side. And she doesn't want to miss anyone who might pass while she's at the bottom. So she runs at a specific place and then she climbs up. She is in Marwa. She makes dua again for sustenance. Ya Allah, send us some goodness. Ya Allah, you are the one. We know you will not let us down. And a couple of times she ran up and down, making dua, looking, checking. Then she heard a sound. She said to herself, shh, shh, I heard something. So she came back down and the, and the sound came from where Ismail alayhi salam was. And there she found a fountain of water, very wide, very big, coming out of the middle of the ground, between rocks. Jibreel alayhi salam had descended and he stamped on the ground and there came out gushing water. She looked at it and she thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She sat down and she wanted to gather the water. So she created a basin like structure with her hands, with the muddy sand clay that now became like clay and mud because it was wet. And she began to say in the language Zam, 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 Zam. It means stop, stop, stop. To this day, we have this water known as Zam, Zam from the same well. After some time, the birds began to come. Caravans used to pass and you know in the heat of the moment they're looking for birds. Why are they looking for birds? Not to hunt the birds, but wherever you see a bird, you know there's some water nearby. So the clan of Jorhum was passing from that area and they noticed some birds in the middle of nowhere. They were not expecting them. So they decided to check up on what is happening and they sent someone. Go and see where these birds are flying to. So the birds had gone and they were sitting around this well and the water was gushing, they were drinking and this messenger finds a woman with a little baby. So he went back to his people, the people of Jorhum, the caravan and he explained to them. They were very, very amazed. They came, so they asked the woman, do you mind if we live here? 
Why? Because there's water running from here. So she said, look, you can come and stay here on condition that this water belongs to us, not to you. We'll allow you to drink from it, but it's our property, not yours. So they stayed there. They were very happy and they loved the little child. And as the child grew, they taught him Arabic. They were pure Arabs. And as he grew up, his father used to come and go. His father, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, when he came back at one stage, he'd seen, mashallah, this is the setup. And he was quite happy with it. And he used to come and he used to go. And then the big test comes to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And you could imagine Ibrahim alayhi salam for 86 years waiting for a child. You could imagine and picture how the heart of Ibrahim was so attached to his son Ismail. And then the sacrifice comes where Allah Azza wa Jal tells Ibrahim to move away Hajar and Ismail from him and Sarah. Now the bigger test comes. Ismail alayhi salam becomes a young, fit teenager, righteous and pious, God-fearing, loving Islam and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You could imagine now the heart of Ibrahim is even more attached to his son Ismail when he sees his son fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling to Allah, worshipping Allah azza wa jal. And the big test comes. Now this one was even bigger than the first. It wasn't just one where he had to leave them. Now it's even bigger than the first. What was it? He showed him in his dreams a command. What he saw was that he was slaughtering his son with a knife. And keep in mind, my brothers and sisters, prophets and messengers do not see any foolish dreams. What they see in their dreams is an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now Ibrahim alayhi salam is in a great test. He's in a very, very tough position. He did not hesitate with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it was clear, he carried it out. He told his son, he says, Oh my son, I have been instructed in a dream by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to sacrifice you. So what do you think I should do? He says, Oh my father, do as Allah has commanded you. You will find me from amongst those who are patient. He took Ismail alayhi salam and they were going. And he had taken his knife and he had sharpened it very well. One narration says that he says, Don't tell my mother yet. Iblis will come trying to turn Ibrahim away from what he saw. And he came up to Ibrahim and he told him, Oh Ibrahim, you're going to go and slaughter your son. You just saw a dream. Maybe it was just a dream, a foolish dream. So Ibrahim grabbed stones and threw him, stoned him. Then he went to Ismail, trying to turn Ismail away from following his father. And Ismail also started to cast him with rocks and stones. And then he came to both of them and from start to cast him with rocks and stones. And that's why when you go to Hajj, you throw those three different throwers, reminding yourself when you attempt to do something for Allah, be firm and strong. And then they come to a big rock. Surubu to lay Ismail on it and to slaughter him. His son said to him, Ya Abi, please turn my face over so you don't feel compassion and you stop the command. So he placed him on his forehead, his face down to the ground. Ibrahim alayhi salam grabs his son. His face is towards the ground. The knife is sharpened in his hand. He puts it on the neck of Ismail alayhi salam and he tries to slaughter. And every time he tries to slaughter, the knife will spin the other side. And again he tries to slaughter and the knife will spin the other side. And Ismail alayhi salam kept on saying, put more pressure, put more pressure. Harder father, maybe you're not putting enough pressure. And when they were confused in that state, Allah says, we replaced him with a ram from paradise. And Ibrahim alayhi salam slaughtered and sacrificed that ram from paradise. And he looked and he'd seen this is a ram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called out, Oh Ibrahim, you are indeed truthful to us. We have tested you and you have passed the test. Now you can ask what you want. It's all yours. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. This was the ultimate test. And the passing of the test was not only for the father, but even for the child. Indeed, this is a very, very clear manifest test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Peace be upon Ibrahim. This is how we reward those who do right. Ibrahim is from our righteous believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Ibrahim. Ibrahim the one that fulfilled Allah's orders. Everything that Allah had ordered Ibrahim to do, even when it came to slaughtering his own son, Ibrahim fulfilled Allah's orders. And then what happened after that? Now the great reward comes in return. Allah Azza wa Jal, not only after he ordered him to slaughter Ismail, not only that Allah Azza wa Jal kept Ismail for him, but now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him another child, Ishaq. And the days went past, and then another order comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Ibrahim alayhi salam in an era where no one or hardly anyone was saying la ilaha illallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will order Ibrahim alayhi salam to build a house as a symbol of the oneness of Allah Almighty. And Ibrahim alayhi salam will go to the valley of Mecca. And he'll see Ismail alayhi salam. And he'll say to Ismail, O oh son, Allah had ordered me an order. So Ismail will say, Do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordered you to do. So Ibrahim told Ismail, And would you help me? So Ismail said, Yes, I will help you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, And we showed Ibrahim the place of the bait. Al bait is another name for the Kaaba. And there is narrations that says that Ibrahim was instructed by Jibreel on how to build the Kaaba. So Ibrahim alayhi salam was the builder and Jibreel was the architect that showed Ibrahim exactly where the place is and how to build it. And they start to build the Kaaba. And Ibrahim alayhi salam will put the foundations of the Kaaba. They were making a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as they were doing this. What was the dua? Oh Allah, accept this from us. Oh Allah, we are putting up a house for you. Ibrahim alayhi salatu was getting the rocks from Ismail alayhi salam. There was no mortar used, no cement. It was just rock on rock on rock on rock. Each one was fitting into the other. As they putting it up, now it's getting a bit high. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously caused a specific rock that he was standing on to go slightly higher. And he placed it. Then it would come slightly lower. He would get the next one. Then it would go slightly higher. He would place it. And when the Kaaba was built, Ibrahim will constantly stand on the side, look at the Kaaba from far away, see any angle that's out of line, any height that's higher than the other side, and constantly contemplating and thinking the best way that he could perfect the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now the Kaaba is built. But... Every corner of the Kaaba, four corners, they all look the same. So if you want to start circulating around the Kaaba, where are you going to start from? So Ibrahim told his son Ismail, Oh son, go and find me a rock, different from all the rocks that you see, to put it in one corner, to distinguish the corner that this is the beginning of the Kaaba. Ismail was so tired from working during the day and night and building the Kaaba, so he told his father, Oh father, I feel a bit tired. So Ibrahim told him, Get up and go and do this. So Ismail got up. And he went looking for rocks, rocks. And most of the rocks, they all look the same. After a while, Ismail comes back. And he sees his father carrying this white rock to put it in a corner. But this rock, where did it come from? It's not a common rock that you could find anywhere, especially in the area. So he told him, Oh father, where did you get this white rock from? He said, Jibreel got it from me from the heavens. And that's the rock that we call the black rock. And now it's black. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he says, It was white and it became black from the sins of people. And it's not as big as it used to be. Throughout years, we reduced few tips here and there, fell down and was stolen in some areas. So it's smaller than the original size. When they were completed, they were making a dua. Oh Allah, make both of us surrenderers to you. And oh Allah, 
from our progeny also, make them those who surrender to you. And show us the way that we worship you in regards of performing the actions of Hazm. And accept our repentance. You are the one that accepts the repentance. Or oh Allah send from among them a messenger that will call them to your religion and teach them your book. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the dua of Ibrahim when Allah sent Muhammad from the people of Mecca to teach them the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to teach them the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember when Ibrahim was put to test by his Lord with certain words which he fulfilled. Allah said, I will make you a leader to the people. He pleaded. And also from my offspring, Allah said, but my covenant does not extend to evildoers. Yani Ibrahim salam said, oh Allah, make my children, their children's children, great leaders. Allah said, I will do so. I'll make them leaders except for the wrongdoers, the evildoers. And suddenly the rock he was standing on, it softened for a moment and his footprint was left on the rock. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that footprint in the Quran. Where the footsteps of Ibrahim are, literally the physical footsteps, you need to fulfill salah for the sake of Allah at that point. Somewhere close there. In order to preserve it, they've covered it up so it is protected from erosion and so on and they have placed a metal covering on it and it is known as maqam ibrahim the footsteps of ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam if you look into the glass box you will notice two feet and that is the imprint of the feet of ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam to this day it is there it was right with the kaaba Umar ibn al-Khattab moved it slightly further back and it's sitting at that position up to today. Although once when the floods had come, it went quite a distance and then the people brought it back. But it is there to this particular day. So these are miracles. These are signs of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. And then he said, and we covenanted with Ibrahim and Ismail that they should purify my house, the sacred house for those who encompass it and for those who retire to it for devotion and prayer and for those who bow down and for those who prostrate themselves therein. The Prophet Sallallahu said that never will the Haram, the sanctuary of the Kaaba, never will it be empty of people until the last hour. There will always be people in there. It has always been and will always be until the last hour and truly Subhanallah, there was a companion who made tawaf around the Kaaba swimming. How did he swim? Because there was a flood. A flood happened, everybody left. And he stayed in there. He said, Wallahi, I will not leave. And he made his tawaf swimming. <laughs> the non-Muslims see us going for Hajj and the pilgrimage. They don't know what we are doing. We are re-enacting what Ibrahim alayhi salam did and what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam followed because he was instructed to do the same. So not only are there physical footsteps of Ibrahim, but even the spiritual footsteps we are meant to be very, very close by. And Allah tells us in the Quran, indeed the first house appointed for people is the one at Bakka. Bakka is in Mecca. Blessed and the guidance for the worlds. This is the first house in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the people of the worlds, the nations of the worlds to flock to it in obedience to Allah. And now the Kaaba has been built. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells Ibrahim, the Kaaba has been built, now call people to come and visit the Kaaba. So Ibrahim looks around, who's there? Who's gonna come? There's no one around. So he said, oh Allah, where is my voice gonna reach to? So Allah Azza wa Jal told Ibrahim, Oh Ibrahim, you do your job and what you've been ordered to do and leave the rest on us. We give the results. So Ibrahim got up and he said, Oh people around the world, Allah had built a house of His and He orders you to come and perform pilgrimage. So come and perform pilgrimage. So Allah made the voice of Ibrahim reach everywhere. Till this day that, he go and perform pilgrimage because of the call of Ibrahim. Allah tells Ibrahim alayhi salam, and you will find they will come on every lean camel from every valley and from very, very far away, they will all come. Then we have a very interesting story 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of when Ibrahim alayhi salam went back to his wife Sarah and there came a time when some visitors visited him. In the narrations it says there were three angels that came to him. They were Jibreel alayhi salam, Mikael and Israfil. This is what it is said. There were certainly angels, we don't know which ones in specific, but it is said that it is these three. But they came in the form of human beings. That's why Ibrahim alayhi didn't know who they were. So he treated them like guests. And they say to Ibrahim, peace be upon you. So Ibrahim alayhi salam responds back, peace be upon you too. And Ibrahim welcomes them in his house. And he brought them a meal. What was that meal? Allah says, a prepared roasted calf. And when he saw that they were sort of putting their hands forward, grabbing the meat, and they were acting like they were eating, the food would not actually enter their mouths. They would return the food back. Because the angels actually don't eat. He got afraid of them. They said to him, don't be afraid. We are messengers from your Lord. Allah sent us with two missions. To come to you to give you some news. And to go and destroy the people of Lut. Now remember, if we made mention of Lut alayhi salam, he's the nephew of Ibrahim. And Ibrahim alayhi salam told him to stay in a certain place known as Sadum. But they said, we have come to destroy the people of Lut. So his wife heard. When she heard, she started laughing. Laughed in the sense that finally something is being done about the people of Lut. And while she was laughing, the big news comes. Oh Sarah. Well, there's good news for you. You're going to fall pregnant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be rewarding you and granting you a wise child. Ibrahim Aysam says, do you give me glad tidings after my old age? What glad tidings is this? He's happy. As for his wife, Sarah, it was more amazing. She came screaming and she slapped her cheeks. I'm going to bear children. Sarah, at that moment, she was 90 years old. She started to say, I'm going to give birth and I'm an old woman. And my husband is even older than me. How would this be possible? When I was young, I could even get children. Now, we're going to get children? So she said, this is amazing. They told her, are you amazed from Allah's matter? Well, there is another good news for you. Not only that you'll fall pregnant and you will get Ishaq, you will even live long enough until you see the son of Ishaq Yaqub. It is said that she lived to about 140 years old or so, and she met her son Ishaq and after him his her grandson. She didn't live on to see Yusuf alayhi salam, but that's another story insha'Allah ta'ala. Then Ibrahim alayhi salam, once his fear was gone, he was more worried about Lut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he started debating with us about Lut and the people of Lut. He was saying, look, you know what? There's a man in there. If you're going to destroy all of them, Lut is from amongst them. Don't you know that? So they said, look, oh Ibrahim, let's not talk about that. You just turn away from that discussion because it is the instruction of Allah that they will be destroyed and that punishment will come and it is not going to be reversed. Done. So he was reassured that Lut would be saved. And he was reassured that the people who had believed would be saved. And then he had bidded farewell to these particular angels and they left in their own way. When Ismail alayhi salam had married and he was in Mecca, his father Ibrahim alayhi salam used to come and go. He used to be between the Arabian Peninsula, between Mecca and Asham, Asham meaning where Palestine is today. So as he used to come and go, one day he came into Mecca. Nobody knew who he was and he entered the house. He knocked on the door of Ismail alayhi salam. Lo and behold, there was a woman who answered the door. He looked at her and he asked her a few questions. He greeted her. She responded and he asked her, how is your condition? Where is your husband and what is he doing? And she complained one way to this man. Firstly, she didn't know who he was. Secondly, she began to complain. No, he leaves us here. He goes away and he, we don't really have much. You know, we're struggling and so on. There's hardly food and what have you. Now, Ibrahim alayhi salam was on another level. And so was his son, Ismail alayhi salam. They were those who submitted to Allah. 
they did not have room in their lives for any contamination of that. When Ibrahim السلام, heard this woman, he was upset. So she was complaining about her own husband. So Ibrahim السلام, looks at the woman and says, tell him that there was a man who had come and he is saying salam upon him and he asks him to change his doorstep the threshold of his door tell him look this threshold he needs to change it so she said no problem and he was gone now ismail alayhi salam came when he came as he entered he sensed that his father was here so ismail alayhi salam asked his wife was somebody here she said oh yes the man came who was he i don't know who he was but he was you know an, an elderly man and she described a little bit of a description and we can stop there for a moment to, to describe to you what was Ibrahim alayhi salam looking like. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that when I went up in Mi'raj, I saw the Anbiya, the Prophets, and he described them one after the other. Until he says, I saw Ibrahim alayhi salam, the closest description for you is to look at me and that is what Ibrahim alayhi salam looked like. He looked similar to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are both known also as Khalilain, Allah has taken both of them as the closest of friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she described the man and she said, this is what he looked like. So he asked the question, did he have any message? Yes, he passed you salams and he said that you need to change the threshold of your door. Immediately he looked at her and said, that was my father instructing me to divorce you. You are the threshold. You're the one who answered the door when I wasn't here. And he's telling me, I need to divorce you. And he told her, please go back home. Now, where was she from? She was from Mecca. She was from the tribe of Jurhum. And Jurhum, they brought Ismail up. And they got him married. And Jurhum accepted her and told him, don't worry, we get you married to another. And time continued. This man was married again to another woman from the same tribe. And he lived. After some time, Ibrahim alayhi salam came back. Exactly the same thing. He knocked the door, the door was opened and he asked this woman after greeting her, how is your condition? And she said, no, Alhamdulillah. She didn't talk excessive talking with him. Alhamdulillah, we praise Allah on all conditions. That's it. So Ibrahim alayhi salam looked at this woman and he tells her, pass him my salam and tell him he should maintain the threshold. He should maintain the doorstep. So when Ismail alayhi salam came back, he felt that his father was there. He asked, did anyone visit? She said, yes. She described the man. But this time when he asked, what did he say? She said, well, he said, I should give you salam and you should maintain your threshold, meaning the doorstep, keep it. So he said, that was my father telling me to keep you as a wife. You're a good woman. Alhamdulillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about some of the books that he revealed to Ibrahim. Now we don't have that scripture with us, but the Quran makes mention of some of what it contained. One of the things that is mentioned in the book given to Ibrahim, behold, you are giving preference to this world, yet the life after death is better and it is everlasting. This Allah says we wrote it in the book that we gave Ibrahim. And it's repeated for us in the Quran. Amazing. So we do know there was a book and we also have some of what was written. There is much more than this, which is mentioned in the Quran. I've only given an example. Now there was a dispute between the Jews and the Christians at the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some were saying, no, Ibrahim was a Jew. And the others were saying, no, he was a Christian. And there was a debate. Each one is claiming that they are closer and more deserving to Abraham. So Allah answers their questions with so much beauty in the Quran. Allah says, those who have the greatest claim to Abraham, may peace be upon him, are those who follow him in his submission. And this Nabi who is here, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the believers, which means the Nabi and the believers have followed him in the submission. So they are the most deserving when it comes to the claim over Abraham because they surrender to their maker and they worship their maker alone. Now the Jews and the Christians continued saying, no, 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 no. He was from us. And these said, no, he's from us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds in a beautiful way. You should know that Ibrahim was neither Jewish nor Christian. He was a submitter 
to the creator and he never ever associated partners with his own maker and the word submitter happens to be Muslim so he was Muslim in that he was a submitter and over and above that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he places the final nail by saying O oh people of the book why are you disputing about where Abraham belonged you want to call him Jew or Christian but the Torah and the Bible were only revealed after him so don't you have brains you calling him Jewish but the Torah was revealed after him you calling him Christian but the Bible was revealed after him so Allah says don't you have the sense to understand he was a submitter and this is why in those verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam call the people of the book call all the Christians call all the Jews invite them by saying O oh people of the book come closer to us come and let's join ranks on one common word between us that none of us should worship any besides our maker alone without associating partners with him at all and none of us should believe that any one of us should be worshipping one another. Don't worship one another. Don't worship a human. Don't worship a prophet. Don't worship a saint. Don't worship a messenger. Don't know. Worship Allah alone. And that's it. And that's the word that Allah tells Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to invite the Jews and the Christians with. And Allah says, if they still do not want, then you should just say, we bear witness that we are the submitters. And this is why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us all, and he tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well. Ibrahim himself was an ummah. Look at the word used. What is the meaning of ummah? Ummah is referring to two things. It refers to leadership. He was a leader. He was a powerful leader. And ummah also means he was a nation in the sense that he had so much goodness that he was the founding pillar of entire nations to come after him. That it was equivalent to all the others who came after him subhanallah and after that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then we reveal to you O muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam follow this pure pristine path of abraham may peace be upon him for indeed he was not from amongst those who associated partners with us then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again praises ibrahim alayhi salam in the quran allah says who can there be better in religion than the one who has submitted to Allah and he has followed the pristine path of Abraham may peace be upon him without associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hence Allah took Ibrahim as a Khalil as a close friend and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then Ibrahim made duas to us and we answered them one after the other he made a dua oh Allah grant security in this place oh Allah save myself and save my offspring my children from worshipping idols for indeed these idols have led a lot of people astray oh allah whoever follows me they are from me and whoever does not follow ya allah you are most forgiving when allah responded ibrahim allah said i will grant you all the goodness i will give you the produce i will give you every form of goodness and for those who follow you as well as for those who disbelieve i will give them a chance i will give them respite I will give them goodness in this world. Whoever turns to me turns. Whoever doesn't, then they will be subjected to severe punishment if they don't turn before their point of death. Allah says, Ibrahim, he was a person who was always thankful. Allah chose him and Allah guided him to the right path. We gave him goodness in this world. And even in the Akhirah, we have taken him as those who are pure to enter into the Akhirah on the highest of levels. When Allah tested Ibrahim alayhi salam, he passed all the tests. So Allah says, Oh Ibrahim, I appoint you as an Imam, as a leader. Allah speaks about the progeny now of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We made them also Imams. We made them also leaders who were calling towards us. And we revealed to them to do good and to enjoin that which is good and to give out charities and to fulfill their prayers. These were some of the things that Allah revealed upon the children of Ibrahim. All of this out of the status of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's not a normal man. And Allah praises him in the Quran. He says, Ibrahim, the one who fulfilled all of his duties. He never looked at something minor and said, ah, oh, it's all right, I'll leave it. And I'll just do the major things. He even did the minor and the major. He never took any part of his worship to Allah as for granted. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of praising Ibrahim alayhi salam, not only did he mention him in the Quran in high esteem, look what else he did for him. He gave out of his lineage, every single prophet and messenger that came after him came from Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah says, and we granted Ishaq and Yaqub to Abraham. And we ordained the prophethood and the book to be among his progeny, among his children. And we gave him his reward in this life. And in the hereafter, he shall be among the righteous. Allahu Akbar. This is an enormous, unbelievable praise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That all the scriptures which Allah sends down, the revelations, came from the children of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The Torah, the Zams of Dawood, the Injil, and finally the Quran, all came from the children of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he gave him Ishaq and Yaqub, and from him came the children of Israel. And from them all their prophets, right up to Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And John, Yahya alayhi salam, and Zechariah and all of them. And from Ismail alayhi salam, no other prophet came except for the seal of the prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amazing honor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah says, and we granted him Ishaq, Isaac, and Jacob. Each one we guided, and before them we guided Noah, and of his offspring David, and Solomon, and Job, and Joseph, Moses, and Aaron. Thus we reward the doers of good, and Zechariah, and John, and Jesus, and Elias. All are from the righteous, and Ismail, and Elisha, and Jonah, and Lot, and all we chose above the world, and of their fathers, and of their offsprings, and of their brethren, and we chose them, and we guided them to the straight path. Look how many prophets and messengers, and rightly, all from the progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah has chosen Adam and he chose Nuh and the progeny and he chose the family of Abraham and he chose the family of Imran. May peace be upon them all. Allah chose them over and above all of mankind. And this is why Allah speaks about jealousy. Are they being jealous with the normal and ordinary people regarding the virtue that Allah has given them? Allah says, hang on, we want to tell you what we gave someone else. The family of Abraham, we gave them all three things that you could ever be jealous about. What are the three things? We gave them Al-Kitab, which means we revealed books to them. We gave them Hikmah, we gave them the wisdom, we gave them the path. Look at Ibrahim, how he spoke to the people, how he conveyed the message. Look at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam from the family of Ibrahim, how he conveyed the message sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we gave them in the family of Abraham lots and lots of not only property, but even authority. Take a look at David and Solomon, Dawood and Suleiman, may peace be upon them. They were prophets and they were kings at the same time. Then we have the death of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. He passed away and it is reported and recorded that he passed away in an area in Palestine, which is today known as Al Khalil, also known as Hebron. And where he passed away, he was enshrouded by his own children and buried there, subhanallah. Then there are the two children of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail and Ishaq. The older one is Ismail, may peace be upon him. The younger one is Ishaq. Not much has been mentioned in the Quran about both of them besides the story of Ismail alayhi salam prior to him having been granted prophethood by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After that, Allah makes mention of very few qualities of him. Allah says, make mention of the prophet Ismail in the book. He was very, very truthful to his promise. He used to fulfill his promises and his appointments. And he was sent and he was also granted scriptures. He used to constantly remind his family members to fulfill Salah and to purify themselves, giving charity. And he was one whom Allah was pleased with. This is what is made mention of Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. As for Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah makes mention of him where he speaks about the prophet Jacob and where he speaks about the fact that he was the father of Jacob, Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. Who is there better in a way of life than someone who has submitted their whole life to Allah and they are among the righteous in actions and they follow the same way of life of Ibrahim alayhi salam monotheist never worship more gods and Allah chose Ibrahim as his best friend.